Let's everybody take our song books. We're going to turn to page 390. There's power in the blood. Page 390. We'll ask all those who are able to scan. Sing with us.
Good evening. Good to see your smiling faces in the house of the Lord. And I hope you're as excited as uh, I am to be here and to see what God's got in store for us. And we are just as privileged as we possibly could be to have Pastor Damon with us. And uh, uh, if he preaches half as good as he's been eating since he's been here, <laughs> boy, we'll have a humdinger tonight. Now, I can't keep up with him, and that's saying something. <laughs> Glad you're here. Hope and pray that God will bless you in a great and mighty way uh, while you are here. I've learned something over the years that a preacher preaches about as good as the congregation prays. So if we'll just lift him in our prayers, ask the Lord to undergird him and strengthen him, both physically and spiritually, uh, I'm sure God's got a word for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great, great privilege that's ours to come together one more time on this side of eternity to hear your precious word, that word that's already been sung, will continue to be sung, and then how precious it will be to hear it preached. And I pray, Father, that you'll take your messenger, hide him behind the cross, give him the words, give him the strength. And I pray, Father, for the hearts that you've already prepared to be in this place tonight, that you'll minister by your precious Holy Spirit in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Are you looking forward to that day? You talk about a real day. When the dawning of that day comes, it'll be like no other day. We may start out going to jobs, going to school, doing whatever we typically do. But when there is the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel, and we see the clouds begin to roll back. And that same Jesus, that same Jesus that went away, the Bible said is coming again. And boy, I'm glad of what he's coming for this time. He came to die for us before. He's coming to get us the next time. And as unworthy as I feel, I get to go. I may go earlier. I may go in death you may be alive and remain, but one thing about it, when he comes, those that have gone to the grave, the graves will burst open, and those of us that are alive and remain will be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we all get to go together. What a precious, precious time that'll be. I want you to listen. I know most everybody in here knows Pastor Damon, and... Uh, when he was up here uh, back just before Christmas, uh, I talked to him about this, and uh, we prayed about it and caught touch with him after the first of the year. We both agreed that we should wait till good weather came. <laughs> it got here today. <laughs> we probably should have prayed for it for a day or two earlier, but it got here. And uh, I'm, we're so privileged tonight for God's man to come. Uh, I've known him to be a man of integrity, a man of commitment, and a man that loves the Lord with all his heart. And so you pray for him as he comes. And whatever God sends us in the word, every single one of us will get something out of it tonight if we'll just listen. So you pray as Damon comes.
<laughs> Thank you for coming. You didn't have to come, but I'm glad you did. You uh, got a little Methodist church that called a bishop to come to preach for them, but the crowd was real thin, just a few people there. And he asked that young pastor, said, did you tell these people I was coming? He said, no, sir, but the word must have got out anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'm all fixed up with two microphones, and I hope you can hear me. Pardon? Can you hear me? If you can hear me. Oh, yeah, everybody hear me. Okay, thank the Lord. Revival is an opportunity because it's a tremendous privilege that God gives us. Stephen Alford says that revival is an invasion from heaven with a wonderful opportunity that's given to us. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, when Ronald Reagan was being sworn in as president of the United States, when he took that oath, his left hand was on his mother's Bible, and it was open to the Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and repent of their sin, turn from their wicked ways and repent of their sins, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive them their sins and heal their land. And in the margin of that Bible, his mother had written, this is the most wonderful verse for the healing of nations. And I think that it's a tremendous opportunity for us to, to think about revival. I believe we need healing. When we think about this nation of ours, only 6% of the population of the world reside here. We just have 6% of the world population. And yet 80% of all the divorces happen here. 80% of all the whiskey that's drunk in the world is drunk here. And we outpace all of the other industrial nations in murders, rape, and major crimes here in the United States. And yet, not long ago, a few years ago now, we turned our back and allowed the God, the Bible, and prayer to be systematically just taken out of our church, out of our schools, out of a public forum, and replaced with atheistic secularism. Our nation is now atheistic instead of Christian. We need revival. A revival that only God could give. I have, have a piece of paper that I want to read something to you. One of our citizens, a very prominent person said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us and we have vainly imagined in our deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to God that made us. His name was Abraham Lincoln. That was 1863. Wonder if he could see us now, what he would think. You and I need to be thinking about it. <clears throat> this Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. That's from Solomon was building the temple. <clears throat> Seven years he was building that great temple that his dad David wanted to build and God wouldn't let him. Seven years and then on the completion of it, he prayed a prayer. 
Oh God, if, my, if your people sin, if they have, are overset with all kinds of famine, with all kinds of difficulties, will you hear their prayer if they turn toward this place? And if they pray, <clears throat> and in the 12th verse of that chapter it says, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself as for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens, that there be no rain, if I, can, if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, God was saying, it's altogether possible that I'll bring all of these difficulties that you think about, all that you've mentioned in your prayer, it's altogether possible, I'm warning you of that, but I also want you to know that if my people, which are called by my name, will do some things, then I will do some things. Two things to notice in that. First of all, he says, if my people, the my people, and he wasn't talking just to Israel, he's talking to us as well. If my people, which are called by my name, that doesn't mean that he says, if all of the politicians would get right, if all of the, the things that are going on that are wrong in the world will get straightened out. He's not saying that. He said, the, the problem is with my people. We don't like all the things that are going on, but it's not, the, not the, up to them to change. Revival is for those who are saved, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Revival is to us, to me, and I pray that I can be revived by his Holy Spirit day by day. I'm so grateful for what he's allowed me. But the second thing that I notice, he says, if, that's the biggest two-letter word in all the English language, if my people, that means there's a possibility that you will or won't. There's the po potential of something great. There's a potential of God just doing exactly what he's promised. And the potential that he doesn't do it. If my people, which are called by my name, will do these things, then I want to do some. <clears throat> and he gives us four requirements. <clears throat> First of all, it says, if my people will humble themselves. That's not easy. <clears throat> we don't like to humble ourselves. You see, to humble yourself means you bow the knee. You prostrate yourself. You get to the ground. You, you recognize that you're no longer superior. That there's somebody that's bigger than you are. You got to realize that to humble. That pride is such a difficult thing. Pride caused Adam and Eve to be kicked out of the garden. Pride because they suddenly thought, we can be just as wise as God. All we have to do is listen to Satan and eat of this fruit that's offered to us. And instead of becoming wise, they lost what they had. Pride goeth before destruction, a proud look before a fall, the scripture says. And so we need to humble ourselves. That's a voluntary thing that must, must be done. I think about the humbling. You remember when Israel had crossed over Jordan, and Joshua went over near Jericho, saw a man standing with a sword in his hand. And he walked up to him and he said, Art thou for us or against us? And this servant of God said, Take off your shoes. That means you humble yourself. And I'm going to take care of the battle, but you've got to do the humbling. Take off your shoes because of the ground that you're on. And I think it's so interesting for us to think of that <coughs> humbling ourselves. <clears throat> I feel like that prodigal son Jesus told us about, so proud that he thought, oh, Pop may have made a pretty good estate in his time, but we're living in a new age and I can just better this whole thing. Just give me what I'm gonna get when, I die, when you die and I'll go out and make a fortune with it. He wasted it, riotous living. And I'm sure that he had no intention of winding up in a hog pen ready to eat with the hogs. That wasn't his goal when he set out. But he found himself thinking, in my father's house, even the servants have bread 
to spare, more than they can eat. And here I am perishing with hunger. That's a humbling experience to come to the place of think, I was so smart that I could make it better on my own. And suddenly he said, I'm going to go home. And I'm going to say to dad, I'm sorry. I've sinned against heaven in thy sight. I'm not even worthy to be called one of your sons. Just make me as one of your hard servants. And dad saw him coming afar off. A humbled person now. A man who is willing to bow even before his dad and say, I was wrong. Not many of us ever want to use that word, I'm wrong. We don't like to use the word, I have sinned. But in humbling ourselves, we come to that place that we recognize that we need to be humble before him. <clears throat> Thank you. That's Fritz if you don't know him. Thank you. <laughs> to humble yourself, to think of what God can do for us. I think of the little story of Ruth. <clears throat> you remember Elimelech and Naomi went down into Moab because it was famine in Bethlehem. It was not God's will for them to go down there. You, you don't go to Moab. That's a, out of God's country. But they went to Moab. And in time, Elimelech, Elimelech died and both sons died. And those daughters-in-law were going to return with Naomi to Bethlehem because she had heard that now they were, they were eating in Bethlehem. Things were better. And it was going to be fine. And so she told them to go back to their families, go back to their homes. And Orpah did. But Ruth said, entreat me not from, to leave thee. And let me follow you wherever you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you're buried, I'll be buried. It makes me wonder, just as a sidetrack, what kind of life that Naomi must have lived before those daughters-in-law, that they wanted to follow her home and give up their own families. At least Ruth did for sure. <clears throat> but when, that, when they got back to Bethlehem, she began to glean, have you, you know the story well, in the field of Boaz. And in time, Boaz wanted to redeem her, redeem the property. And he was a near kinsman, had a right to do that, and probably almost a responsibility. But there was another nearer kin, kinsman, one who had the superior right. So Boaz told him that this is what you need to do. You need to redeem this property and you need to marry Ruth. Keep that progenity going. And he said, I can't. I can't, but you can. That's humility when we come to the place to say, I can't, but God can. When we humble ourselves before him and recognize that he's God and he ever always will be, he's the God that wants us to serve him and not to feel like we can carry everything on by ourselves. We've been a proud nation. and We've done a lot of things that we shouldn't have done, but <clears throat> we need to recognize that God says, I want you to humble yourselves. Secondly, pray. We talk about prayer, but praying is so essential. It's so important. Revival comes by agonizing, not by organizing. You could have called an outstanding preacher. You didn't, but you could have called somebody that was really outstanding to deliver the messages during these nights. You could have had the greatest music in the world. You had some good music. You could have had all kinds of organization, but revival doesn't come in the organization. Revival comes in agonizing with God for his Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our lives to do that which man cannot do, to do the impossible. And how wonderful it is when he does that. He wants us to do all of these things that he might yield that fruit of righteousness for us. We need to recognize prayer is so essential. And you, we sometimes think it's so, we're so feeble in our praying. Weak, I can't, Pray like you, somebody else maybe. 
The night that I prayed to, for the Lord to save me, I didn't know how to pray. <clears throat> and I still don't as far as I'm concerned, but I know I can talk to him. Maybe a weak prayer as far as others are concerned. But I read about a pastor by the name of John Ramsey. <clears throat> he had a habit. Somebody provided him with a rose boutonniere. Every Sunday he wore, wore that rose and he was proud to wear it. One Sunday, however, there was a young boy, just a youngster, came up to him and very politely asked him if he could have his rose. And the pastor said, thought in his mind, he said, well, I'm just going to throw it away anyway, no problem. But he said, what do you want this rose for? He said, I want to give it to my granny. Last year, my parents divorced. I went to live with my mother, and then she decided to get married again. She didn't need me, sent me to live with my dad. My dad said he didn't have room for me, didn't want me, so I went to live with my granny. She loves me. She cooks for me. She provides for me in every way, and I want to give her that rose. By this time, the pastor's eyes were filled with tears, and he said, no, you can't have it. But you see those flowers on that altar table, beautiful bouquet? You take that to your granny. She deserves more than just that little rose. And the boy said, what a wonderful day. I ask for one rose and I get a whole bouquet. I go to God and I ask him for, to save me by his grace. And he's given me 77 years of blessings. Plus the fact that I have eternity to look forward to. Ask for just a little bit. Save me from my sins and cause me to know that I've been forgiven of my, my sins. My prayer may not be worth much, but it was worth a lot to me. I learned to pray this early in this year. Almost 90 years, I'd never been in the hospital for any time except maybe a surgery in and out. <clears throat> never for sickness. Two weeks, and some of those nights, I wondered about that next breath. And there was a lot of those nights that I learned to appreciate the 23rd Psalm so much. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. And to pray the prayer that, Lord, I know that whatever the results, I'm with you. What a marvelous thing it is to be able to pray and to know that in our hearts and lives. But then not only did he say for us to humble ourselves and pray, but then to seek my face. That's to seek to focus. A lot of our modern, modern churches, we do everything else except to seek God's face. We ought to come together to worship. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all of his benefits. We come, we ought to just lift up praise to him. But we're trying to see how big we, we have a church in Knoxville that boasts, the, it has the tallest steeple of anybody else's. Well, that's great, isn't it? But we ought to be worshiping God, praising him for what he's done. Each morning as I get up, I like to thank him that he had let me live. It doesn't matter to me when he wants to take me, but if he let me live, I'm going to do my best to serve him for another day. And we need to thank him for that. But when we <clears throat> seek God's face, we need to seek that focus. You ever watch a little girl <clears throat> wanting something from her daddy and she climbs up in his lap and she's talking, but he's kind of not paying attention. She gets his, turns his face toward hers because she wants him to see her. Seek my face because I want that full attention. I want you to know who I am. And I want you to know my need, seeking God's face, that we might have his glorious presence among us day by day. And then he says something about purity, that we turn from our wicked ways. We allow ourselves to drift into sin, into those things that are contrary to the will of God, the things that don't, don't help our testimony at all. We allow things to, to pile up in our lives 
and we need to turn from those that we might be able to get back to him in full repentance. Over in Psalms chapter 66, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Over in Isaiah, the 59th chapter, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is it ear heavy that it will not hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God says it's our fault if he doesn't bless us. If my people, the if is con conditional, and we need to remember that. How marvelous it is. <clears throat> but he says, not if, but if you do all of that, I will hear. Not a, no condition. I will hear. And I'm glad that he hears me. I'm glad he hears me when I pray. And I'm glad he hears us when we want to do our best for him. And then he says, I'll forgive you for sin. That's a promise. Forgive your sins. And I'm glad for that forgiveness because he's ready to forgive just as surely as that prodigal father, father was willing to re receive his son back. This my son which was dead is now alive. He was out in the wilderness, but he's back. And then he said, I will heal their land. See, the thing that's so wonderful, when, when I confess my sins, ask God to forgive me of my sins, turn my face toward him and ask to seek his face, when I have all of that done, he does something for me. He forgives me of my sins, heals me of all the problems, but he also causes that to radiate to those around me. It blesses not only that family, it can bless a whole church, it can bless a community. And I believe with all of my heart that revival could begin here in Lakeside. That re would reverberate in all of Michigan and maybe in all the world. I believe that. I believe God meant it when he said, if my people, which are called by my name, do these things, then I will, I promise that I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. God has promised. And how marvelous it is. And then that marvelous thing, the results, that God, that we're God's people and he wants to do all these things for us. I don't know the need of anybody here tonight except me. And I'm not sure I always recognize my own needs. But I know there are times when we go through the motions of worship, we don't really worship. We don't really praise him for all that he's done. And I just feel like that there are times when we ought to come to the place to just sort of take inventory and say, am I where the Lord wants me to be? In this congregation, no doubt there's someone here, you know you've been saved, but you wouldn't want the Lord to come right now at 20 minutes till eight. You wouldn't want him to come because I'm just not quite ready. There's some things that are just not where they ought to be. Revival is to recognize those things are there and admit them and be willing to ask God to forgive and to cause our lives to be changed. I'm not saying you're all lost and on your way to hell. I'm not saying that at all. But there's the possibility that there's somebody here that's missing blessings week after week, day after day in your life because you're just not where he wants you to be. You think of all the blessings that a prodigal mix, missed out, out in that hog pen. In his father's house was everything that he could have wanted. He knew by all that from experience. But, oh, he had it in mind that there must be something better out there that I can get into. And was really, when he got to the place to be ready to return home, then the father killed the fatted calf, got the robe and the ring, and said, let's have a, a party. 
because it's time to celebrate. How marvelous it is that we can celebrate. We, we sung, what a day that will be. What a wonderful day it's going to be when we can just be with Jesus forever and forever. But I don't want to take a lot of baggage with me, do you? I don't want him to say, wait a minute. What about those unconfessed sins? What about those things that you did that you shouldn't have done? Well, I don't know, Lord. I didn't do those. Tonight, I'm going to challenge us to make this the beginning of revival. That we had come to the place to look at our own heart and ask ourselves the question, is God speaking to me? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. Bow your heads, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there anyone in this congregation? We're going to have an invitation in a moment. But is there anyone in this congregation that you would be honest enough, be willing to confess enough to say, I'm that person. I know I've been saved, but I'm not where God would have me to be right now tonight. And you'd lift your hand and say, pray for me. Any like that? Yes. Yes. Are there others? Yes, you can take them down. Others? Pray for me, yes. Others? Not where God would have me to be. There may be people here that are lost, never been saved, and I would appeal to you as well, but tonight I pray that we might begin as God's people to see the need of responding. In a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. And when we do so, I trust that those of you who held up your hand will take another step. Come to this altar and let's pray together. We'll pray with you. Do our best to help you in any way we can. Father, I pray just now for these who have been honest enough, bold enough to lift their hand. I'm not going to put any pressure on them. I'm going to tip, trick them in any way. But I pray, Father, that you'll just help them to say, if revival depends upon me, I want to do my best tonight. Father, I pray that you'll just cause people to move in response to your invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand? Will you come in response to the invitation? It's not from me, it's from God who says, come unto me, will you come tonight? Come on. You that lifted your hand, would you come? Let's pray together. Will you come? Amen. Amen. Will you come? Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. You know you've been saved, ready to live for the Lord. God bless you. And are others, others that will come, God bless you. Any others? prayer again in just a moment. Someone else might like to respond. Maybe you're here and you've never been saved. Be a marvelous time for you to give your heart to Jesus. Why should I? Because there's no way to get to heaven without it. You've got to be saved by God's grace. And he is bidding you to come. He loves you so much that he was willing to die on the cross for you. 
as we sing again, or if there are others who will come, please do. Come on. <clears throat> Shall we pray? Father, we come to you in the interest of this, our brother, who honestly would confess that he needed to draw near to you. Father, help us, all of us, to lose that pride and that kind of self-sufficiency and come to the place to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I pray for him. I pray, Father, that you'll just strengthen him and cause him to know the power of your presence. Bless this meeting, Father, that it may be able to be seed sown for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Much. Thank you, Reverend. If my people, if you're saved, that's you. I'd like to ask them maybe for one more verse of this. Let me say this to you. Um, I've said this most of my ministry. When we come through the doors for revival, if we're saved people, this is not just Lakeside. This is everybody. And you may say, well, if I, I come down there, I don't know how I fit because I'm not a part of Lakeside. This young man was not a part of Lakeside. But he followed the impression that God placed on his heart. So I want to ask you, if you'd like to go home this evening with a joy in your heart, having rededicated your life to the Lord, it will not only help you, but it'll help all of us that are here. And we couldn't have heard a better message than what we've heard tonight. And so while they sing one more verse, I know that kind of puts you on the spot a little bit. And you'll think sometimes, what will all those people think? First of all, that really is not a consideration. Our consideration is what he thinks. And if he draws on your heart tonight to draw you closer to him, all he's asking you to do is to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. And I do want to be just a little bit closer to my master. Would you consider that? Would you consider coming tonight? Because not only, as I've already said, it will not only help you, it'll help all of us. While we sing one more verse. How about you? Take my Take my life, Lord, and make and it holy thine. That's really what God asks of each and every one of us. I gave my life for you. I want you to give your life to me. How about you tonight? How about you? That step that you're thinking about taking, that's a tough step because you usually have to take that one by yourself. But if you'll take that step, you won't walk alone. God will bless you. God will help you. How about you?
Did you appreciate the message tonight? Good message. And uh, we got a good start. We need to build on this. So I want to encourage you to come back tomorrow night. Bring somebody with you. Pray for somebody you know that either needs to be saved or needs a closer walk with the master. If you'll do that, God will bless you in your efforts of praying. If you'll contact them in some way and invite them to come. Uh, God's working in, in precious ways. Uh, Dame and I were at the restaurant tonight and uh, two friends came in, uh, Sandy and Kim, right? Did I get that right? And uh, they used to go to Monroe Church and, and uh, they sat right across from us and they recognized him. I thought, Lord, you're in the arrangements of this even while we're eating a meal. How precious that is. I'm, I'm glad God knows all about me, aren't you? Love you and appreciate you. Glad you're here tonight. Precious singing, precious preaching. And let's go from this place tonight determined in our hearts to return tomorrow night at 7 o'clock and not let Satan beat us out of a good blessing. Amen. God bless you. You're at liberty to go.